Okay. Right, sorry uh, everyone, um, we got started a bit late because we had a problem with the special general meeting getting a quorum. So um, that held us up getting this talk underway. So tonight I'm just, it's just going to be a basic um, talk about telescopes, how they work, a bit about what you need to know, issues with them, optical quality and things like that. So I'm going to begin talking about these two physical um, phenomena that basically are used in the construction of telescopes. And the first one here is um, the um, law of reflection. So you can see the beam of light comes down to a reflective surface and you can see the angle of incidence there from the vertical is 50 degrees and the exit angle is the same from the vertical. In other words, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. The refle amount of light reflected is never 100%. There's no possible physical way to achieve that. Basically, there's always going to be a certain amount of light that will be scattered from the surface or absorbed. Um, the best reflectors, you can get something of the order of 98% perhaps, um, with a special kind of um, what they call enhanced coating. The other thing about this type of mirror that we use in astronomy, it's what's called a first surface mirror. So if you're familiar with a bathroom mirror, there's actually a glass plate in front of a silvered surface at the back. That has an advantage in that the silvered surface or aluminium surface on the back is protected from corrosion. So, um, and if the mirror gets dirty, it's, you can clean it without damaging the actual reflective material on the back. But for astronomy, we want maximum performance and minimum aberrations because you put a glass plate glass in front of the mirror, it's going to um, cause optical aberrations. Although some amateurs have used plain mirrors like that, bathroom mirrors as secondaries on Newtonians as a cheap way. You're not going to get perfect optics out of it, but it's a sort of a, a cheaper way to do it. The other thing we do nowadays is that um, two materials generally used, most common is aluminium. Silver can still be used sometimes, but silver tarnishes really even more easily than aluminium. Both materials are soft, but there's a process these days that um, in a um, vacuum chamber they can actually coat the reflective layer of a very thin coating of a um, hard silicon dioxide usually, which protects the, the metal surface, doesn't interfere with the reflection, but it means that um, you can actually clean it much more easily without damaging the metal surface. And of course that's a plain mirror, which we do use in a Newtonian secondary, but of course there's nothing to stop us using a curved mirror, which we can use for focusing the light. So that's um, the first physical principle. Oh, I already mentioned this. First surface mirrors, coatings, aluminium or silver, and the modern ones generally have some kind of protective overcoat. The overcoat is really thin. Um, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but it might only be a micron or two, might be less. Okay, the other kind of um, phenomena we use in a telescope is um, called refraction. And I'm sure everyone here would be aware of this. A simple example is to put a pencil in a glass of water and it looks as though the um, pencil in the water is displaced from the pencil in the air and that's caused by this phenomenon known as refraction. It was studied by Isaac Newton actually um, after the telescope was invented in the early 17th century by um, some Dutch spectacle makers, Galileo picked it up and um, he just basically copied their design, made some small improvements, but there was no real st study or understanding of how this worked. So we see here again a beam of light as we saw in the case of the mirror, but you notice that there's still some reflection from the surface and this, again, you'll never get a perfect optical glass which will get no 
zero reflection, so some light gets lost. You can also get, um, as the light passes through the, the um, glass, you can get some scattering due to imperfections in, in the glass itself. So optical glass will be annealed so that there's no tiny bubbles in it and it has the um, most perfect optical quality. Otherwise, it's going to spoil the image by causing uh, scatter within the glass, which is going to reduce the contrast. And any other problems in the glass can, co glass can cause worse optical problems. But you notice the ray that goes into the glass um, doesn't go straight. It gets deflected at an angle. And that's the phenomenon we're talking about, which is called refraction. So in other words, the, the beam of light is bent as it passes through the surface from the ear to the glass material. We won't worry about this too much, but if you've, I'm pretty sure they used to do this in high school physics. Um, it's what's called Snell's law. And it turns out this phenomenon of refraction is because the wave front of the light, when it passes through air, is travelling at a certain speed. When it hits another material, the speed of the wave front actually changes. Um, so the speed of light is media dependent. And there's a speed of light in a vacuum. Speed of light in air is very close to the speed of light in a vacuum, but air does have a refractive index. Glass has a much higher refractive index, so it slows down more. And the, um, if you look at the angle of incidence there, and you see the sign of the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction there, the ratio of those two signs is proportional to the, or is equal to the ratio of the, the speeds of the two light rays. And um, we can um, talk about that as the, uh, we can use a substitute for that as called the refractive index. So it tells you how much the light gets deflected. So those are the two things that um, are used to um, build and design telescopes to fairly basic physical laws. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, studying this, discovered that there's a problem with refraction and that Snell's law depends not only on the, uh, the, the type of glass you're using and you know, its refractive index, but also the colour of the light. So the refractive index isn't constant for all colours. So um, this is seen in the case of a prism where the different colours color, are refracted by different angles. In fact, this turns out to be a really useful physical phenomenon because it allows you to study the properties of light, which Newton did. He found that after passing through a prism, he could recombine the colours and get back to white light. So this is great for physics because it's, if you've heard of spectroscopy, which I'm sure everyone here has, it uses this phenomena to um, study the different um, uh, colours in light and see things like um, emission and absorption lines that were discovered a couple of hundred years after Newton. So, um, but it's a real annoyance if you're designing a telescope because you've got to cater for this problem somehow. So um, this is an example of the refractive index of different materials. Um, you've got um, a special kind of flint up the top there that's used in some eyepieces. Um, pretty normal flint, F2. And some crown um, glasses that are used for optics. And then the fluorite one. Um, fluorite crown glass like that is um, often referred to as an ED glass. The manufacturers, if they're using glasses of that type, they'll say that it's an ED lens. means um, extra low dispersion. But it's more of a marketing thing than anything. You have to look at the graph of the performance of the, of the particular optical glass. Um, you can um, see from that that the, that the um, refractive index isn't a constant. It depends on the wavelength along the bottom. So the optical designer can get around the problems by combining two different types of glass, or three sometimes, in the modern, modern um, refractors. Yep. 
Um, well, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. The, you could make a lens just out of fluorite crown, but it will still not be colour free. You have to combine it with other glasses. Um, the idea is that you use a bit of trickery to try to cancel out the dispersion by um, you know, shaping the lenses. And what optical designers do these days, they have software that helps to um, do this. So there's a program called ZMAX, which you can buy, it's quite expensive. Um, there's another one called Oslo, and I think Oslo had an education version, which is free to you. So if you want to play around with lens design, um, you can, you can, um, they have sampled lenses and you can play around with them and see what happens when you modify them, change the, the uh, shape of the lenses and the separation of the lenses and the glass types. Um, and that they also even cater for anti-reflective coatings and the effect that they have on the optical system. So it gets quite complicated and these software will often have some kind of optimization built in, so they do their basic design and then they try to optimise it to get the best spot size out of, out of the lens. And one thing for telescopes that um, helps the telescope lens designer is that we're focusing at infinity. It's actually a much harder job for a camera lens designer because they have to optimise over quite a short focusing position way out to infinity. So it's a lot more demanding to, and that, that's why if you look at the sort of glass that's inside an expensive camera lens, <laughs> they're incredibly complex. If you ever, ever see a diagram of what's inside a camera zoom lens or a, a prime high quality lens, they have a lot of different lens elements in them. Okay, so here's the simple um, refractor lens such as Galileo use, and as you can see there, the different colours don't um, come to the same focal point. And um, Galileo, in, the, in those days, they didn't know how to deal with this, so they just made the focal length a lot longer, and then the difference becomes um, less of a problem. But then you end up with really long telescopes if you have a large aperture. So... Um, in fact, the next diagram shows this. So you can see where the objective lens is held way up on the top of this um, structure here. And then you've got somebody way down the bottom um, looking through the eyepiece. So um, this type of refractor rapidly became uh, not only unwieldy, but completely un unpractical. Sorry, what was that? Yes, yeah. well. <laughs> okay, so um, um, I think it was um, in the 18th century where a um, couple of people realised that Chester um, Moore Hall and the, the Dollins independently discovered how you can partially overcome this problem. And the, what they did was combine a crown glass with a flint glass. They have different dispersions. And you can see that in this particular example, um, I think it's got the red and the blue coming to the same focus and the green out of focus. You wouldn't normally design a lens that way. The normal way for visual observing is to bring the green and the red to focus and the blue, the blue will be left out, which is why... I don't know if you've seen a lot of cheap what they call achromats or achromatic lenses that use this system that um, bright objects will have a purplish fringe around them and it's because the blue and violet um, light isn't being brought to focus with the, um, the other part of the visible spectrum. So that's called an achromatic lens because it partially solves the problem. So um, modern, you probably, you probably see the term APO on a, um, a, either a camera lens or a telescope, refracting telescope. Now that uh, refers to the term apochromatic, which means that you bring all the colours in the visible spectrum to the same focal point. Um, 
these are relatively available now because they are mass produced. But if you went back 15, 20 years, they were really hard to get hold of and really, really expensive. You could get them from places like Zeiss, um, Astrophysics Inc., and one or two other places. Now there's lots of manufacturers of these and the sort of because uh, at the time these lenses were hand figured by sort of family type oriented companies, but now they're made by sort of industrial scale companies, so they're, they're much more affordable. But they're still going to cost a lot more than an acromat because they use some of those ED glasses that are that are really quite expensive and also generally difficult to figure because they're quite soft and. Um, so the actual process of figuring them to a nice, smooth optical shape is, um, is a lot more demanding. So if we remember back to, um, well actually just a bit quick comparison here. Oh, I've, I've already discussed this. APO versus achromat. Obviously the APO is going to give you the better view. Um, but it's going to cost more, even today, it's still going to cost more than an achromat refractor. So we go back to, um, well, let's use mirrors then. And the big advantage of a mirror is that um, uh, the, that simple law we talked about at the beginning, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, is not dependent on the colour of the light. So the same rule applies to all colours. So you, um, you don't have to worry about chromatic aberration with a, a mirror-based system. You do have other issues. Because it's first surface to get the best quality, it's prone to get dirty. Um, so you have to clean it and the surface is quite soft. Whereas a, generally a refractor lens is a bit more forgiving on cleaning. Obviously you still have to be really careful with any any optics, but they are more robust than a, a mirror surface. So the, um, the idea of the Newtonian is you have a, a curved mirror, the shape being a parabola. The reason it has to be a parabola is that because the light from the star that you're looking at, for example, is so far away that essentially the rays coming in from the star are all parallel when they hit the mirror. And it turns out that if that's the case, a parabola will bring that, those rays back to the same focal point. If you have a spherical surface, um, it turns out that rays from a point at the centre of curvature will, will all come back to a point, but the parallel rays from the star won't. They'll, they'll all be focused at different points. That's an error called spherical aberration. You can get away with spherical mirrors again if the focal length is long enough. But generally, we prefer to use shorter focal length mirrors um, because the, the tube is more compact and um, also, for, especially for photography, you want a fast focal ratio. So we will use a, a parabolic mirror and any of the good brands will say they have a, a parabolic um, primary mirror. Okay, so... Um, Pros and cons, I talked about the spherical main mirror and um, the F-ratio. The other problem I didn't mention with the um, Newtonian, it's fine for stars that are near the centre of the field of view. That's called on-axis stars or any on-axis object. Um, but as you get further from the um, central part of the field of view, there's another problem that occurs called coma. And it's called cool. Coma, I think it means here. So the stars right in the corner of the field of view look like they've, they're sort of blown out and hairy going away from the centre of the field of view. One way to um, fix this is to use a longer focal length again, then the problem becomes less. But um, you can also fix it with a, a sub-aperture corrector that you put in the eyepiece holder called a coma corrector. For Scopes say up to f6, uh, f6 or longer, you can, the eye can accommodate it. You don't really need a coma corrector. Um, for photography, you will need it. Or for very fast Newtonians like an f5 or f4, 
um, some even faster these days, and you generally have to have a coma corrector in there the whole time, otherwise the coma in the outer part of the field is going to be distracting. So the advantage of the Newtonian is that it's a low cost because it's a simple system. You've got one curved mirror, one flat mirror, fairly simple tube arrangement, so you're going to get the most... Um, aperture for your money. And aperture is really important for astronomy, gives you more light and actually more theoretical resolution. So um, another type of reflecting telescope is getting a bit more complicated. In this case, instead of having a flat secondary reflecting the light out the side of the tube like in the Newtonian, we're focusing the light through a hole in the main mirror to a focal point behind the mirror. So the advantage of this one is you get a relatively short tube because you're folding the light path. And um, it's a bit more complicated to make um, because you have to have a curved secondary and it's fairly um, rigorous um, in terms of how that secondary has to be shaped. This type of Cassegrain is... Um, the, basically the Zeiss upstairs, a standard classic Cassegrain reflector. So big advantage and no um, optical problems with colours, colour fringing or anything like that. Fairly compact tube. Optics is a little bit more expensive. And um, that's about it. Um, in some ways... Uh, um, convenient to look for if the thing is up high, is mounted high, um, you've got a, a, a eyepiece usually at a convenient height, whereas really big Newtonians, sometimes you have to get up on a ladder to look through the eyepiece. You might have seen Dave Brock's 20-inch um, Newtonian that, that he brings up to Waharau when we were, in the days we were allowed to have those star parties. Um, so when it's up high on the, looking at an object high in the sky, you had to climb up a ladder to look through the eyepiece. Okay, another type of um, reflector is um, basically an advanced version of the Cassegrain. And instead of um, having a, um, a parabolic um, primary hyperbolic secondary, both mirrors are hyperbolic. And with the right formula and the correct separation between the mirrors, you can eliminate a lot, a lot of uh, the aberrations, like coma is gone, you get a relatively flat field. Um, and um, these are the instruments that are favoured mostly by large observatories, but amateurs have them now. The Society owns one of these out at... Um, QMU Observatory with a 16-inch mirror. Uh, the downside of them is they're a bit more expensive and also, um, as Steve can tell us, they're uh, not easy to collimate. <laughs> because, the, um, because you've got two hyperbolas makes getting the mirrors correctly aligned optically is quite tricky. Uh, in the case of the Newtonian, well, uh, if you weren't familiar with collimation, it's basically aligning the mirrors so that the main mirror, uh, the centre of the main mirror is aligned with the secondary, is aligned with the focus of the tube, and they will have adjustments that you can make to, to do that. Because whenever you move, if you're moving them around a lot, they tend to get, get out of adjustment. It's not a difficult process to do with a Newtonian. In fact, we cover that in another practical astronomy talk. And there's another kind of um, design, which is a hybrid design, which is using both refractive and reflective elements. Um, most common type is the Smith Cassegrain, and there's also the Maxutov telescope. I think um, the Society have got a little Maxutov in the rentals, or did we have one? We've got SCTs, okay. We, have, we do own a 12-inch um, Maxitov. It's big and heavy and it's a bit pity, but it lives in the cupboard in there. It's not a portable telescope, so to use it you'd really need an observatory and a fairly hefty mount. But let's have a look at the Schmidt Cassegrain. <coughs> 
So the difference with the classical Casa grain is that the, um, you can see the secondary mirror here is actually held on a glass plate and that, that plate is not um, just a flat plate of glass. It looks flat to the eye but it's actually specially shaped to correct for um, some of the aberrations that you'd get from a simple um, system which I believe these disused spherical mirrors um, I think that's right, and the, the, this plate here, which holds the secondary miracle, the corrector plate, um, corrects out the issues with, um, that you'd get otherwise with secondary mirrors. The reason for it, it's relatively inexpensive to make because um, the spherical mirrors are easy to, to polish out to a nice perfect sphere. Um, the tricky part is the corrector, but I think... Um, Mead or was it Celestron back in the um, 1970s figured out a really easy process to make these correctors that made it easy to mass produce these so from sort of 1980s onwards and I remember when they had the return of Halley's Comet in the 80s um, huge numbers of these um, 8 inch Mocrasa grains flooded the market in the US so Mead and Celestron made a lot of money out of it but it said that the ones at, at that time you should avoid because they let the optical quality um, slip a bit. So you're better to buy a, an older one or one newer than that time. Okay, this is Maksutov. Um, this um, looks a little bit like the um, Smith Cassegrain except that, all the, well again, all the surfaces are spherical, but it has this um, massive corrector plate, and um, the secondary mirror is actually the corrector itself, so you just have a silvered spot in the middle of the secondary that acts as the secondary mirror. And these give really um, good optical performance. The downside of them is that they're difficult to make, corrector plate is really big and heavy, they take a long time to cool down. Um, the 12 inch one in there would probably be probably a couple of hours before you can get the thing performing just because of the, the large amount of glass in these things. But they were quite popular with amateurs because dedicated amateurs could actually make these whereas making a smith Cassegrain wasn't really feasible. Okay, um, next topic, um, fairly complicated looking picture here. Um, the next thing that's important to us apart from the telescope is we want to actually use it. And to do that, we, if we're using it visually, we need an eyepiece. If you're doing photography, obviously you don't. You can put a camera um, so that the sensor of the camera is, is right on the focal plane and take pictures, just like a camera lens or in fact the way your eye works. You can think of your eye as a telescope with the retina as the camera. So what we need here is to view the image after it's been focused by the telescope is to use an eyepiece. And it shows a couple of refractors here. Don't worry about all the lines and rays and stuff. But the version at the top, you notice that the eyepiece is, is concave. And that was the way the first earliest telescopes work and basically Galileo's telescope was like that. And the advantage of that kind of eyepiece is that it gives you an upright image. So if you're using it for terrestrial use and you look at a tree, the tree appears the right way up. Um, whereas um, um, Johannes Kepler came up with a scheme where he used a con a, a convex lens like you see there and um, well actually it's a plano convex because it's flat on one side but generally they'll be convex on both sides for this type of eyepiece. Now the advantage of this is that you can get a wider field of view than you can with this type of eyepiece at the top here. Unfortunately though the image is upside down but for astronomy, you don't care about that. So um, that's why most um, eyepieces used for astronomy of the Keplerian type um, 
generally not a simple lens like that, though they're much more complicated in general. So the eyepiece sizes, um, you obviously fit the eyepiece into a focuser tube and there were, in the old days, I haven't seen any around for a while, used to get 0.965 inch ones um, back in the day. I don't, do you ever see any of those around still, Steve? Oh, occasionally, but... Yeah, generally if somebody finds an old telescope in their garage, they might might have that kind of focus of that takes eyepieces of that size. I had one, uh, but I sold that a few years ago. Right, okay. There are still a few of them around, but any um, modern telescopes will either come with a one and a quarter inch focuser, notice imperial, not, not in millimetres, or a, a two inch focuser. Sometimes you can even get a three inch focuser um, on some telescopes these days. Um, or maybe even four. So you, to use these eyepieces, you just have to use an adapter. Uh, you can obviously adapt down to a smaller sized eyepiece, but you can't go the other way. So generally, um, if the eyepiece has a longer focal length, it's going to be lower magnification. So um, generally, really wide angle eyepieces will be the two inch sort. Um, and that allows you to see more of the field without starting to vignette the field. So with um, the um, focal length of the eyepiece, we usually are quoted a number, like you might have a 10 millimetre eyepiece, a 30 millimetre. That sets what the magnification of the system is going to be. And the way you um, work that out is you divide the focal length of the telescope by the focal length of the eyepiece and that gives you the magnification of the system. So the shorter the focal length of the eyepiece, the more magnification. Uh, the other thing that an eyepiece can do gives you an apparent field of view. So that's what, the, what appears to the eye, the, the size of the view you can see, not the actual real um, view on the sky, um, but the apparent field that the eye, eye can see, so you, how much you can look around inside the eyepiece. Um, these tend to range from maybe even less than 40 degrees, or well, some modern expensive eyepiece can be over 100 degrees apparent field of view. And the more the apparent field, generally the more exp expensive the eyepiece. Okay, these are a couple of advanced designs. There's a whole lot of different brands. These are Teleview ones because I could found some diagrams of the uh, lens layout. You see these eyepieces, they're quite expensive um, uh, eyepieces and you can see why because there's a lot of glass elements in them. They all have to be made to high tolerances with anti-reflective coatings. Um, generally, the ethos... For example, if you were to buy an 8-inch reflector, what are they now? About 800 bucks? 900. 800 or 900. Um, the Ethos eyepiece will cost more than that, probably paying over $1,000 New Zealand for it, maybe more. So <laughs> your eyepiece is costing more than the telescope. I um, believe you, uh, Robert, you owned one of the Nagler's, I believe, or you had a Nagler? Ethos. You've got one, OK. How do, how do you find that? Very good, except the, the Ethos one, uh, it's uh, 3.7 millimetre. Oh, so it's a short focal length, so for looking at planets and, and yes. the like. So I just need a very still night to be able to use it. Right. So maybe once or twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still worth it. Okay, so that's, that shorter focal length is going to give you a real high magnification, but as um, Robert says, the problem about high magnification it's not going to work very well if the air is unsteady. You need a really steady night where there's not much atmospheric turbulence to get the benefit of those. But um, they do, they have a um, long focal length ethos eyepieces as well. And um, Astron's company owned by the Society have some pretty reasonable uh, wide angle eyepieces that are a lot more affordable than those but still give good views.
Um, the other thing that amateurs will often use, and photographers as well, is a thing called a Barlow lens. And you see it's, it's actually like the eyepiece that was used on a Galilean-type telescope. It's a, what's called a negative lens. So the reason you would use this is that um, if you've got a um, short focal length telescope and you want to look at planets, it's hard to get a lot of magnification out of it. So you use a, a Barlow lens, which typically a, um, a two times Barlow will double the effective focal length of your telescope. So it might go from a 500 millimeter telescope to a 1,000 millimeter telescope, which is going to be a lot better for viewing planets in the moon, whereas the, the shorter focal length is great for wide angle views of star clusters and things like that. Okay, um, in the case of photography, we may want to do the opposite, where we think our focal length is too long, so we use a thing called a, a field reducer, or a focal reducer, sorry. So um, it's ex exactly the opposite of a Barlow. It changes the effective low focal length to be shorter. And this is useful for photography because it reduces your exposure time because you're actually concentrating the light of the, or the image into a smaller area. So the object on the sky, say a galaxy, is going to be in a long focal length eyepiece will be spread out over the sensor, um, which you might be able to see more detail that way, but the problem is it's going to be a lot fainter. So um, using a reducer brings your galaxy to a small linear size on the chip, so, but it's still the same amount of light, but it's falling in a smaller area, so your exposure is going to go faster. So that's why you would use one of those for photography. And um, also, this is a fairly strange looking diagram, but um, it shows one lens that in fact, we talk about focal plane, but a, a simple lens like this doesn't really have a focal plane. It, um, the focal plane is actually the surface of a sphere. So in other words, it's a curved surface where the light is focused. So for, you can see that if the object is right on the centre of the axis, it's it's on this sort of plane, but as you're looking at objects further from the centre of the field of view, it's actually um, um, focusing away from that plane. Uh, this is highly exaggerated, that would be a really terrible situation, um, but uh, most um, designs do this to some degree, and um, visually it doesn't really matter, you can accommodate it, but a camera will notice that the, um, the outer parts of the field of view, especially if you've got a really big chip, you'll see that the stars in the corners might be a little bit out of focus, and it's actually because of this phenomenon called field curvature. Um, even the RCs have this. I don't know if it's enough to be a problem on our camera. We've got a full-frame camera. Do they see any field curvature effects in the corners? Uh, it's not too bad on the 60. Yeah, yeah, but um, to get around this, you can get a corrector that you put in the um, uh, sub aperture corrector that fixes this um, problem called a field flattener. And it, the problem with a field flattener it isn't a generic; it has to be designed for the optical system. So if you've got one for a Ritchie creation, you can't then go and use it on some other telescope because it's designed to correct a specific amount of field curvature. Sorry? Um, I don't think so. Does, do we have any that sold locally or...? Um, uh, the more you pay, the better quality you get. Yeah, like anything, I guess. Yeah. So cropping the image is probably a lot more cheap. Yes, yeah, that's right. You can just crop the corners just, out. Just, just speaking <laughs> of the name of the photography, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I myself have got a camera uh, corrector field platinum um, from Axon. Oh, so okay. About, uh, Thirty or forty dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah. That that won't be a top That's end. One, one and yeah, so um, that probably won't be a top end type of um, one, but yeah, that would probably be useful for um, 
for it. Like, if, um, yeah, it's a bit tricky. You see, it's a coma corrector, so it's designed for probably a Newtonian. So you wouldn't you, you wouldn't use that on a Ritchie Cration because you don't have coma. So you'd actually the coma correction would actually make things worse. That's as I say, the corrector has to match the optical system for the for this particular type of uh, device. Bill, yeah. What would happen if you put a lens on the back of that field flat and used it visually? Because your back of your eyes curve. Your your eyes can accommodate the field curvature. You don't you don't need to use a um, field flattener if you're doing visual observing. But I mean, if you look through a flattener, would it be messed up because it's flattening the curve? Um, you know, I think your eyes would be able to accommodate because you can you generally look at a particular part of the field with your eye and focus on it and your eye will just um, correct it anyway so just by refocusing so it's, it's not required for visual observing the sharp part of the vision field is actually really small so the eye is constantly scanning anyway yeah so you'll scan and focus on the bit that you want to see so you'll you, your eyes will be actually correcting this error anyway, so there's no no use for it. For it's only really for cameras, where they actually have a flat sensor. Although I believe some there are some sensors that are curved, <laughs> specialty ones, yeah, for astronomy, like for use with Smith cameras and the like. Um, also, uh, be a custom sensor. Uh, Okay, yeah, that that might be referring to something slightly different. I'm not sure about that, because you wouldn't use an eyepiece. Well, you um, you can actually use an eyepiece with photography. You can um, use it for planets as a method called eyepiece projection to create a fairly high magnification. For you, have you ever tried that, um, Robert? I have. Yeah, probably for planets. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very fiddly. Yeah. Okay, the other thing we might use are filters. Um, example of why would you use a neutral density filter, for example. Neutral density filter just dims the whole field. The reason you'd use that is for viewing the moon, obviously, because it's really bright and dazzling to look at for a telescope. So it's a lot, you can observe a lot better by um, dimming the image down. Um, you can also um, use an aperture um, block, block some of the aperture, but the problem with that is you're losing resolution as well, which you probably don't want to do. So you'd use a neutral density filter for that. Um, here's an example for an O3 filter. It could be useful for observing planetary nebula because it brings out the contrast of uh, the colours in the nebula. Um, planetary nebula emit a lot of light in the, um, from O3 emission, which is doubly ionised oxygen. Um, UHC filter um, can be used to block artificial light sources. And there, are, there are a few different sorts of these, but unfortunately a lot of the sodium vapour lights, which had two lines in the yellow, you could quite easily block those. Unfortunately, they're always they're all being replaced with LEDs, which are broad spectrum, yeah. which is a bit unfortunate. <laughs> uh, okay, um, how are we going time-wise? We might call it a a, a day. Oh, okay, I'll just quickly cover these um, formulas for visual use. So this is. Um, some things you, um, the first one is D, the, which is symbol used for the aperture. So how big is the uh, mirror or the primary lens? Um, that formula in brackets where it says the sine of some angle is equal to 1.22 times the wavelength divided by the aperture. That's basically telling you the resolution, theoretical resolution. So you can see that um, the bigger D is, the smaller theta. So it means the smaller things you can actually resolve on the sky. And also as the wavelength is 
shorter, such as in blue light, you can resolve more. So this, well, the only reason that's there is to show you that a bigger size than mirror or lens can resolve more detail. It's not, a, um, it, it's not without cost. Eventually you get to a certain size and the problem is you can't resolve anymore because you're limited by the atmospheric seeing. So the big observatories, this is why they like to have them on top of mountains where the seeing is better, um, but they are still limited by the atmosphere. But they still go to bigger and bigger mirrors because the other effect of a bigger mirror is to gather more light. So they, although they, they had a limit of resolution and they do have techniques around getting around this light, adjusting the surface of the mirror to counteract the atmospheric turbulence. Um, it's getting into fairly high-end observatories that do that sort of thing. But um, they, the main reason for having a bigger mirror is you can just see fainter objects. But if you put it into space, you get the full benefit of both fainter and higher resolution, which is why they put the James Webb Telescope and the Hubble Telescope up there. Trouble is, it's expensive to put large mirrors into space. Um, the big F number, if you see, that's used to represent the focal ratio of the telescope. And that the focal ratio is the ratio of the diameter to the focal length. So, um, for example, common values would be F6 for a Newtonian, maybe, or for a fast Newtonian, F4. Smith Cassegrain's standard commercial ones are about F10. Richie Cratian's typical is about F8. They can vary a little bit depending on the manufacturer and specific design. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, ATO, uh, F4 to F6.8. Oh, um, F4 would be very fast for a refractor. Um, uh, Okay. And the uh, case on is uh, 6.8. Um, yeah, well, you, it depends on the design. The, um, different manufacturers will have different um, focal ratios. Mm -hmm. um, generally, uh, for a really large aperture APO, like I think there's a company that make lenses of a 12-inch um, aperture, which would cost a fortune, talking maybe $100,000 for a, an APO lens of that size, but they will tend to be a longer, even um, with an APO, they'll be something like probably F8 or F9, so, um, or, or more. A um, couple of other terms, AFOV, if you see that, means apparent field of view we talked about before, it's what are the apparent field that it looks like you're seeing. The true field of view, TFOV, is the actual amount of sky you can see. Like if you can just fit the full moon in your eyepiece, you're looking at about half of a degree will be your true field of view. Um, exit pupil size, um, that's to do with... Um, um, I, I don't know if you... You can see this if you look in a pair of binoculars. You can see um, the eyepiece lens and, it, and if you're looking at a bright scene, you'll see a a circular sort of dot in the middle, that's the exit pupil and telescopes are the same. And the idea is that you want all of that exit pupil to sit and fit inside your eye pupil. And for example, if um, say a binocular or telescope eyepiece um, telescope combination exit pupil is six millimetres, then if you're not dark adapted and you come up to the eyepiece with only a two millimetre pupil, most of the light is not going to enter your eye. So that's why it's important to be dark adapted so that your pupils open as wide as possible to let in, let in the light. The most popular marine binoculars are selling the 50s for that reason. Right. The exit pupil is supposed to match, but I've read that, that not everybody has a pupil that size. Yeah, it varies from person to person and also changes with age. So if you're a teenager, you'll have a bigger exit pupil, uh, sorry, a bigger, in the case of the eye, it's the entrance pupil, 
will be bigger than um, somebody who's my age, generally, but there's differences person to person as well. Um, another terminology, eye relief of the eyepiece. This is quite important if you wear eyeglasses. So if you have an eyepiece with a short eyepiece, but you've got a stigmatism saying you have to wear glasses to view, you'll need eyepieces that have long eye relief so you can accommodate wearing a pair of eyeglasses in combination with the eyepiece. Some of the shorter focal length eyepieces, you have to stick your eye really close to the lens and it, you wouldn't be able to really use it if you had to wear eyeglasses. Um, and the other symbol we come across is just M for the magnification. Um, there's a formula there. Focal length of the telescope is equal to the aperture times the F number. Gives an example there of Astron's 200 millimetre Dobsonian. Um, and the magnification of that same telescope with a 25 millimetre eyepiece. So you can see you, you um, basically the magnification, just the focal ratio, length of the telescope, 1200 millimetres divided by 25. So if you use a 10 millimetre lens, the magnification would be 120 times and so on. You just um, select the eyepiece for whatever magnification you want. You can actually get zoom eyepieces as well. Um, I've never actually seen one but, um, in use, but they, are, they do exist. Well, you've got them on the solar scope. Yeah. Oh, right, OK. And the final formula, um, the true field of view is the apparent field of view divided by the magnification. And it gives an example there of a true field of view of 50 degrees with the eyepiece combination on the previous slide that gave us 48 times. So um, in that case, that kind of lens is 50 degrees is about the um, field of view of a colossal eyepiece you've probably heard of, fairly common design, will give you a one degree um, view. So you'd basically double the size of the full moon. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Are there any questions before we um, close off? Oh, okay, right. Now, a question from Nick. He says, thanks, Bill, great talk. Do you have any practical advice about storage of telescopes, do's and don'ts? I am a Newtonian. Is room temperature an issue for storage? Um, no, but um, dampness is. Um, generally, when you've been out observing, um, it'll often be a lot of dew, and the tube will get dew. You can get dew on the optical surfaces, which can ruin your observing because everything goes hazy especially coming into the winter, you'll notice this. So I think it's important before, that you keep the telescope in a dry storage and also try and dry it off before you store it. So don't, don't leave it with a lot of dew on it where it's not going to dry off because obviously that can um, cause nasty things like mould to grow <laughs> on the optics, which is not, uh, not that great an idea. So generally... Um, after you bring it in, try and dry it off. Don't um, do what I've seen somebody do and wipe, the, um, wipe down the corrector plate or the mirror with a tea towel. This is um, just as bad. <laughs> but dry off all of the metal parts of the actual scope. You could possibly use a hair dryer to try and um, dry off any um, surplus moisture. Um, and store it somewhere dry as well, because we have seen um, where... A uh, family have sort of said, oh, they found an old telescope that belonged to their uncle or something has been stored in a shed and they say, does the society want to bring it in and it's all covered in mould. <laughs> so, and it's pretty hard stuff to clean off and it can actually damage the glass surface as well. Or the, um, if there's any kind of anti-reflective, sorry, um, yeah, um, what do they call them? Um, yeah, anti-reflective coatings on lenses that 
that will be damaged by mould as well. Mm. How do you keep the lot to the dice dry up there? It, that, um, that's the interesting thing. In the dome, it doesn't really get any dew on it. The dome actually seems to, to um, stop that happening. And I presume, do you ever have trouble out at um, QMU with dew? Uh, I have a dehumidifier running in the dome. Oh, oh, yeah, but I mean when the scope is actually oh, operating. Uh, so, not really. If you're in a dome, um, typically because you've only got a small slant, you don't tend to have too many problems. It does happen. Yes. Uh, so we do see dew. Um, but you get more dew if you've got a raw off roof. So, um, uh, I, there's um, Craig Murphy who's got the same scope as Craig Young, who's got the uh, same scope as we've got at Kumi, uh, a little bit further down the country, he's got a roll off roof. He has a lot of problems with the second material gun. Right. What about, I mean, storage wise though? Storage wise, we've got a dehumidifier which keeps it dry. Okay. Um, and yeah, the Zeiss dome is pretty dry in there anyway. Um, I think it helps that it's fairly elevated. And, um, but I've never seen any dew on the mirrors on the Zeiss. Um, have, you, have you ever uh, noticed really it? No. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so the, that was the, that's the big advantage of having a telescope and a dome with a, with a slit. It's really effective at um, stopping the dew from settling. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, circulation is probably quite critical. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, possibly as well, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, the, um, if, if you just have a telescope out in the open during, not just for telescopes, but Jonathan will tell you for cameras as well, the camera lenses get um, absolutely so soaking wet. But um, you, what you tend to use is in that situation is, is some kind of dew heating arrangement. You can, um, you can buy buy them that are either battery powered or through a, um, a 12 volt lead or whatever where um, in the case of a smoke cassegrain you can get ones that just wrap around the tube at the, um, at the corrector plate end and you can put dew shields um, like made out of foam that extend outwards from the tube to, that help keep the dew off, the, um, off your lens or corrector plate. We did have a dew heater, and then we actually found the dew shield worked better than the dew heater. Yeah. Okay. Um, Interesting. Yeah, but uh, if, you're, if you're doing any observing in Auckland, you will have, definitely have problems if you're out in the open, especially getting into, into the winter months. Any, any, anything else? No, no more online, I'm open. Any, any in-house ones? Okay, thanks for coming along and thanks for attending the <laughs> Hopefully.